Pat Mullen and his wife, Judy, is now working with a church in Lake Town. That's near Elkmont, Alabama. Graduate of the school in 2 Timothy 2, beginning at verse 24. I have this reading. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil are taken captive at his will. That's what we're talking about. And it can happen to anybody. When I was in the Memphis School of Preaching, drinking was as far from my mind as anything possibly could be. And for many years after I finished, it was still not a part of my thinking at all. If you'll get a copy of my book and read the first chapter, you will find what happened. And uh, even that is just a small portion of it. But it tells a grim story. And Brother Paul saying he encouraged me to write that. You might say, well, isn't that rather embarrassing? Yes, it is. But at the same time, it is so necessary. It's needed so much in places where we're going to preach. A young preacher who gets out of here, I'm, by young I mean he's, uh, been out of school just a short period of time. And he goes into a congregation, he's going to find in that congregation a lot of things that are wrong after he's there in a very short time. He's going to find people who are living in adultery and he's going to have a lot of trouble with it. He's going to find people who are unsound, uh, teaching all kinds of things <coughs> that are not in the Bible. He's going to find some unruly people that I used to call cranks and you're not going to be, get along with them. You couldn't get along with them if you hung them with a new rope. And so it's just no use. But you have to learn how to deal with those things. And 2 John 9 through 11, we're told, whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And so if we abide in the doctrine, we have both the Father and the Son. Most people whom you will speak will repent. Most of them will. It may take a while, 
But if you'll keep working, even an alcoholic, many times will just repent just because of good gospel preaching. And that's the way it ought to be. That's the way we would like for it to be. But listen, in this lesson, I'm going to tell it the way that it is, not the way that I'd like for it to be necessarily. Now, this is a class situation. Always when I'm in a class situation, if coming out of something and you won't stop for just a minute, you go ahead. I'd really love to uh, have enough time at the end for you to ask questions, but I've just got a long way to go, and uh, so I've got to hit the ground running. But do ask a question if you, if you need to. So addiction will soon rise, raise its head, and, and it can be in the form of alcohol or drugs. Now, some people say there's no difference, but there is. There is a difference between the two. There is a difference between the high that a person gets on drugs and the high that a person gets on alcohol. And uh, as one fellow told me once, you don't see very many old drug addicts, and that's true. An alcoholic may live a long time, but a drug addict will die quick, or quickly. So, the preacher's sermon usually is on addiction, if he preaches on it at all, and he'll talk about the seriousness of drinking, and he's right. He's very serious. My problem is that most preachers do not know how to tell a person to solve a problem. The person that you'll be preaching to, you may able to be preaching to, already knows that he is a sorry person and a sorry example of the human race. He's down on his luck, he's down on everybody, he's down on the world, and most importantly, he's down on himself. So you don't have to push him any further. What we need is to preach the solution to people who have a problem like that. Here's a man, and they're so, they're so sad. They've lost their homes, they've lost their family. Our director at Project Rescue went 20 years where his daughter would not speak to him. 20 years. I think they've gotten back together now. If he had any wealth, they've lost it. I know men who had very good jobs, making a lot of money, but one of the worst things a drug addict can do is make a lot of money because then he's got money to spend on drugs. So when he comes to Project Rescue, Ronnie tries to get him a job at McDonald's. That's see you buy drugs and work at McDonald's. Kind of hard to do. And so we, we try to take them away from it where they can't, can't get to it. And so alcohol, alcoholics will listen. Now listen to this. Alcoholics will listen to another alcoholic before they listen to anybody else. I've gone to places where that uh, I was trying to raise support to uh, go and teach at Private Rescue. And almost without a an exception. I talked with the elders and told them this. Now you've got members here that after I get through will come to me and tell me that they are having a problem with alcohol and you didn't know it. And I said the reason is because that I am one of them. That I have come out of it. Another thing. A preacher will tell an alcoholic, you've got to quit today and stay quit for the rest of your life. And you know what the al alcoholics are sitting there saying? Well, nobody would do that. I'd rather be dead if I have to be sober the rest of my life. But you let a guy come in and tell him, man, I've been sober for 30 days, he'll say, I can do that. Another comes in, I've been sober six months. I think I can do that. He's been up over a month beyond that. Now, am I saying that in order for you to appeal to somebody to quit whatever is good is wrong, you have to do it? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm talking to you about alcoholism, and I'm telling you the truth about it. The worst thought an alcoholic can ever have in his mind is that I can never drink anymore the rest of my life, and I intend to live 50 more years. Nobody can do that. And so we don't take that approach to it. The preacher is doing the best that he knows how to do. With the frustration that he has seen through trying to work with alcoholics. We are frustrating people. You don't think so, ask my wife. Treatment centers are good, but did you know the uh, average treatment center will keep 15% uh, of those who come to them sober? 
and less drunk. We can boast of a record of 43% of those that stay with us for six months. We can keep someone sober for a good while longer if they'll stay with us for a year. If they'll do the program, then they're going to be able to stay sober the rest of their life if they really <coughs> want to. The first thing that a person has to do in order to begin to stay sober is admission. He's got to admit that he had a problem. Back many years ago, I still laugh about it, and, and sometimes you have to laugh. If you don't, you go crazy if you've been through what I've been through. But uh, I found out I had a problem because the local police put me in jail and convinced me. And so I went to, uh, went to a recovery place, and to get into it, you had to fill out an application and answer 18 questions. And something like, when you get up in the morning, you have to have a drink or you can function, things like that, just simple things. And I thought, now, if I fail this test, they're gonna tell me I'm an alcoholic, so I can't fail this test. I gotta be sure that, uh, that I pass it all right. And, and so I answered, uh, I think I answered uh, 13 of them. Uh, yes, that ought to be a good, good 13. And they, uh, they laughed at it when they saw it. They said, if you answered three, yes, you've got a real bad problem with alcohol. <laughs> what? <Well, laughs> I didn't know that I had that. One of Maureen Sanford was a doctor. He was an alcoholic. And uh, Doug Sanford said that when he was the director of one of the treatment centers over at the hospital, that they had a, a guy come in. He was about 17. See, his skin is a big pole, and that uh, he had purple hair, uh, everything on his face pierced that you could pierce, and uh, wore sandals, and uh, he looked right at Marius, and Marius said, do you think you've got a problem with drugs? He said, no. <laughs> so it, you, the first thing you've got to do is convince a person that they have a problem <coughs> with alcohol. Now, of course, as Christians, we know the drinking at all is a problem with alcohol. But when I say a problem with alcohol, I'm talking about somebody who's begun to depend on it. John 5 and verse 6. Remember that Jesus came to a man who needed to be healed and he asked him the question, do you want to be made whole or do you want to be made well? We will not take a man and you cannot help a man or a woman who will not first of all say, I have a problem. It is a mistake to talk to a drunk on the telephone. Even if uh, uh, that person called himself, tell the person you get sober and you call back because you cannot talk to a drunk when he's drunk. You cannot, you can say it in the book and you breathe. It doesn't make any difference. And so don't talk with them when they are drinking. You must want to get sober for yourself. You cannot want to get sober for your wife. Now let me tell you why. If you want to get sober for your wife, then when your wife is satisfied you're sober, then your reason for getting sober is gone. Do you, do you see that? If you want to get sober for your children, then when you satisfied your children, then your reason for getting sober is gone and you will drink again. I know it because I have done it so many times. When you get ready to get sober for yourself, then you can, you can make it. And I've had these men sit across my desk, come in and I used to have to do the intake. And I just asked them, why are you here? Why are you here? Well, Brother Jackson, I've lost this and I've lost that. And, uh, and, and I just stopped and said, just stop just a minute. If you're here for all of that, go home. Because you're not going to do any good. When you get ready to come just because of you, then you can get sober because you will always be the reason for getting sober. <coughs> In Proverbs 23 and 
verse 7, the Bible says, As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And everything that I say to do that, I, I want to say this comes from the heart, and this is <coughs> most important. A man gets sober from the inside out. That's the reason why your alcohol centers, recovery centers, don't work. They fix the outside. And a lot of them just tell drug addicts what drugs are out there. And boy, they'll do so and so to you, and no, you don't need them things. And the poor old drug addict that's in there said, I can't wait to try that. Boy, that must be good stuff. Not doing any good. They're just telling them what to go and look for. Them. And so I know that because that uh, when I was drinking, I was listening to a tape of Brother Marty Sanders. And he was talking about his drinking years, and he said, vodka will get you where you want to go. I said, hmm. He said, vodka will get you where you want to go. Now, I dropped that stuff in your knee. Oh, turned me the wrong side. But folks, to say how bad this is, when I quit drinking, I could drink a pint and a half almost without mixing 100 proof vodka because that's where I wanted to go. Say, well, Roger, why did you drink? I drink the same reason the other alcoholics drink. I drink to get drunk. And no other reason for that. When I started out, I drank so that I could enjoy going to Walmart. Then I drank so that I could enjoy going to the cave. And just wherever I went in, and, and then so that I could uh, go fishing. For too long, I realized I wasn't really doing these things. The only reason I was doing them is because of that. I got to drink if I did them. So why do all these things? Why not just go find a car somewhere in the world where nobody will bother you to drink? And that's what I did. I only had one problem along there because you had to get there. Wherever you're going, you had to get there. And I always was drunk the time I got there, if I made it. Now here's something I tell the men at uh, Project Rescue, and I'm just as serious as I can be in this. I am convinced Let's say that we're in Priceville right now. I am convinced if I went to Decatur and bought <coughs> some liquor and drunk it, that I would get put in jail before I ever got back to my office. <laughs> so I'm being on me. For some reason or another, I can't take a back road. I can't take a high road, low road, or any other road. They're going to catch me. So in my mind, that thought stays there. They're going to get me. And I spend enough time in jail not to want to be caught anymore doing that. That's a good, that's a good prompting. So treatment centers are, they're backing off a good bit. They admit now that they don't need to do any good at all. Many of them have, Bradford has. But now Project Rescue, the courts are really on our side because take the man in, take him away from his whatever his drug choice is, keep him, if we can, for a year. Give him an opportunity to be sober for a year. And then after a year, he's feeling normal and he's sober. I always tell him, if you don't like it, go back there out there and do some more research. But if you like it, you're going to keep it. You're going to stay with it. Some of them haven't felt what we call normal in years. In order for you to help an alcoholic, you have to know what causes alcoholism. I've never known a person that started drinking who had the philosophy, I think I'll become an alcoholic. He starts out with just a drink or two, and he finds out that it makes him feel very good. As a matter of fact, he learns that his problems have a tendency to go away. And then the next time when the problems get a little bit harder, his mind tells him, remember that drink, how you felt? Wouldn't hurt you to have another one, just get over this one. And then before too long, he has to have it just about all the time. So that's the way that it begins in the simplicity of it. In James 1, 12 through 13, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted the any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed. And I'm trying my best to straighten out some bad thinking about people. 
Somebody said, well, Brother Jackson, if somebody brought in a uh, bottle of Jack Daniels and put it right here, would you sit there and start drooling? No. Wouldn't bother me at all. As a matter of fact, I could walk into a liquor store and sit down, and it would not bother me. Not one bit. Well, what bothers you then when I take the first drink? When I, see, as long as the liquor's out here, it doesn't bother me. When it gets in here, that's where the trouble begins. There is what we call the phenomenon of craving. When a man crosses that line into alcoholism, and he has to determine that for himself, that person then will begin to experience craving. That means if I get a, a good drink, it means my bad a large one, the first thing that goes off in my mind is, as it begins to take effect, well, if I feel that good with one drink, I'll feel twice that good with another one. And I feel three times as good with another, and on and on it goes. And a man who is a real alcoholic now is a person who will not stop until he is either out of booze or out of money, or both. That's when he's going to stop. And I don't know how many times. I've had me talk about that. They, they get the bottle and say, now today I'll prove I'm not an alcoholic. I'm going to drink it down to here. And then that's all I'm going to drink. And when he gets down to there, he drinks the rest of it. He will every time. Because, and if you ask him, this is what's so frustrating. If you ask him, why? He said, because I'm an alcoholic. Well, that doesn't make sense. We don't make sense sometimes when we're drinking. And you have to understand that. Do you know what the main cause of alcoholism is? Anybody? Drinking. <laughs> 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 oh, I read it somewhere and didn't believe it when I first saw it because the uh, professor that I read it from said that stress is the cause of all addiction. I thought, no, no. Uh, when I took my first drink, I remember it was in Pensacola, Florida, a place called King's Inn. I wasn't under any stress. Well, sure I was. And I could go back now and tell you about all of the stress that I was under during that period of time. So you just put that down, and that's the reason why it's so dangerous for those of us who drink. Well, you're going to be under stress. And you're going to be a congregation swept that there are a lot of other people under stress, and they are relieving their stress with drugs and alcohol. And then finally, you'll get real mad about the whole thing because they expect you to tell Mark to walk the line. And yet they're out there doing all these things. And finally, if you like me, get to think of what they're going to do. You can't be to join them. I just did the same thing. And that's what I did. It was my way of getting back at them. You know what we call that in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous? That shooting yourself in the foot. That's what that is. Killing yourself. The main cause of alcoholism then is stress. To start is social drinking. That's one drink. And all that that is. I can take your explanation. He said, no such thing as social drinking. He said, the more you drink, the less social that you are. And I guess that's true. If I need to drink so much, you can't, can't converse with anybody. All right, uh, drug addicts, they usually start by doctor giving them pain medication. Now, I never have been a drug addict. That doesn't mean I don't like drugs. All of us like pain pills. I mean, let's face it, you hurt, you hurt. But uh, I can get a bottle of pain pills, and when the pain's gone, get what's left of juice, so she can take it for her knees. And uh, her off infirmities and maybe some aggravation that I can give her. But you don't do that if you're a you're an addict. You don't give anybody a one. And if you're a drug, uh, if you're an alcoholic, you don't give anybody a suck of what you got. Did you hear the story about the guy that uh, he was going along the beach and he found a lamp? And he rubbed the lamp, and Gene came down and said, you can have anything you want. He said, oh, good. He said, you have two wishes. He said, the first thing I want is a bottle of booze that never runs out. Bing, there it is, a bottle of booze that never runs out. He even said, now what do you want? He said, I want another bottle just like it. <laughs> <laughs> How 
How does it start? I'm going to listen very carefully. You can go to books in the library and you can find the alcoholic cycle. But I'm going to give you mine. And you'll find in there 40 things in their cycle. Well, they're baloney what they are. Here's the way that it happens. First of all comes the thought in your mind. If you are uh, not an alcoholic, you just go right through your uh, head and, and not stop. But it starts with the thought. Second, rationalization. This is where that you give yourself permission to drink. You know what I mean when I say permission? You gotta have a reason, really. You know, one fellow said, uh, I'm not gonna drink till five o'clock in the afternoon. And about noon, he said, bye. Five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> so, he went down. so you can find a reason if you want to. Another fellow said, I don't drink except on days at the end. And why? We just got all kinds of things that we, we say to try to laugh at ourselves about things that really were true. The third is the plan. What do you mean by the plan? By that I mean that you've got a plan where you're going to go to get it. And you've got a plan on how much you're going to spend and what kind of booze that you're going to get. You just don't walk into a liquor store and say, what do you recommend? Uh, they'll laugh at you. Not that I ever did that, but uh, they would, I'm sure. Then you've got to put the plan into motion. Now, you're still all right. But the farther you go, the more the heart's going to get for you to stop. You've got to go and do it then. You don't just sit around and think about it. You've got to go and get it going. Then the phenomenon of craving starts. You take the first drink, and then you want the second, third, and you start craving. Uh, see, most people think that it's like the old Western stories, you know, with the, the town drunk who sat bobbing in front of him, and he just goes crazy. You know, it just melts for it. That's not it. It's after that first drink that the phenomenon of craving sets in. The next step is drinking to excess. That is drinking all you've got about what it is. And then sometimes going back and getting more. You find a story in my book where that uh, I drunk until I was out on the river and then pulled out of the river and went and got some more. And then before I got home, wrecked my boat, my car too, and a truck too. It ain't easy to wreck a boat on dry land. Then there's drunk behavior. That's where you become obnoxious to everybody and everything. Most drunks will do that, but uh, some of them will uh, become mellow, melancholy, but others will just tear up everything inside. Then you begin to sober up. You see, you going up this way, now you're beginning to come down, and boy, that hurts. And you start coming down and begin to sober up. By sobering up, I mean that the alcohol is going out of your body. You're not sober. Because I've seen times it took me three days. And the reason I knew I wasn't sober is I'd get in the shower the next morning and couldn't close my eyes. Yeah, the whole room was going round and round. And I kept thinking, boy, I hurt my brain or something. No, it not hurt your brain. You're still drunk. That's what it matters to you. Then a the resolution. Y'all heard the drops uh, national anthem, haven't you? First verse is, God, get me over this, and I'll never do this again as long as I live. Never had uh, known what the second verse is. That's your resolution. And you mean it, too. Oh, man, if I can just get over this. Then comes damage control. you got to go and find out how many things that you tore up and how many people you hurt, and you got to try to straighten those things up, then. And uh, if you've had any craving at all in, in trying to get sober, this is a very important step. If you don't try to straighten up what you've done, then it all connects <coughs> on your back porch, and you really get to the point where you don't think that there is a solution to it uh, at all. So uh, sometimes you just uh, damage a lot of things and you lose a lot of things, things that are precious to you because that Drunk sooner or later began to go into blackouts. And here's something else that uh, people don't understand is a blackout. Now, I used to, a blackout is the most dangerous part of a uh, alcoholic's life. Because in a blackout, a person continues to function. You would probably not know that there's a thing wrong with him, but he's unconscious. 
I don't know how it works, and I don't know how a person uh, functions during it, but I'll give you one example. I put in the boat at Ditto Landing in Huntsville on the Tennessee River one morning and ran up about 20 miles up toward the, uh, toward the dam and did my drinking. And when uh, I drunk the last that I had, when I woke up, I was 20 miles south of Ditto Landing, did not know how I'd gotten there. And so uh, that's, that's a blackout. And you've heard of this on TV. Uh, Dick Van Dyke told about it once. And he woke up one morning and looked down the road and saw something listening and he couldn't find his car went down the road and found out that he had rolled his car into a ditch the night before and didn't know a thing about it. What can happen to you? Run over somebody and kill them. Sometimes you say, well, you sure were lucky you didn't kill yourself. No, I'm lucky I didn't kill somebody else. If I had killed myself during times like that, it wouldn't have been much lost. But you worry about killing somebody else. Well, then after the damage control and got things fixed up uh, pretty well, the next step is the fall. <laughs> this is where it really gets funny because you, I, I'm telling you the truth now, you, you find it after about a week, it takes about a week, you start telling yourself, you know, I got real overly acted on that. I wasn't all that bad. I wasn't all that sick, and I didn't put a very big and, and um, you're in trouble again. You're in trouble again. Well, where are you going to start? Stop. You're going to stop with the thought. If you don't learn how to handle the thought, you're not going to get so. What's the best way to handle the thought? Pray. That's how. I know many times that when I went to get drunk, if I had stopped and prayed, I never would have done it. How are you going to go get a bottle of whiskey when you're praying? You're not going to do that. So prayer will stop that, and there are a lot of other things that can be done in addition to that. For instance, uh, running the tape all the way through is the thought. Just tell yourself, if I go and get this drink, then I know what's going to happen. It always does. Same thing happens. But the worst part of it is the remorse. There are a lot of people who take their lives as a result of drinking. They don't do that while they're drunk. They do that when they're sobering up because they've been way up here and now they're going to go down here and they go down low. And the more that they do that, the more they hate themselves and the more that they know that they're going to do it again and nobody can they've got to be relieved of that thing that there is a solution for it. So let's get the solution to it. We begin with the thought. God is the only answer that you're going to have. I don't care how much training you get or how many speeches you hear. If you don't depend on God, then you're not going to make it. At the thought is where we say in AA, and I'm not a member of AA anymore, but I used to be. I'd like to take a lot of what they say because what they say is, is usually good. The committee meeting starts. Now, the committee meeting meets right up here, and it's made of me, myself, and I. And we all get together and try to decide whether or not we're going to drink. And we always decide we're going to drink. The meeting's got to be broken up. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13, let him that thinks he stand and take heed lest he fall. There have no temptation taken you, but such as common man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. You can make it. But you're going to have to make it right here because you don't have much choice if you go beyond this. At this point, the alcoholic is utterly unable to remember all the pain that his last episode caused <coughs> him. It's at this time that a person needs to call somebody. Have somebody that you can call and talk to, that you can confide in, that you can say to them, 
I'm on my way to get a drink. Will you talk me out of it? And call somebody who knows what they're talking about. But there's no need to call after you've already taken that drink because very little can be done to help you. In order for us to change, we must become a different person. AA sponsors will tell those spon their sponsees, you only have to change one thing and that's everything. Well, where did they get that? They got it from the Bible, from becoming a new preacher, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That's where that came from. But they wouldn't admit it. Oh, no. They don't believe in religion. With a very few exceptions. They don't, they'd stay away from religion. They'd stay away from controversy. So they just tell you, you believe anything you want to make any difference. And then they try to cram some things down your throat that uh, I was able to resist without getting in trouble. I'll tell you this about AA, and I'm not uh, thrown off on AA because if it's done right, it'll, it'll do a good job. But I've sat in many AA meetings and heard people cry, pray and cuss in their prayers. Can you imagine anything like that? And then they talk about, they don't want anything about uh, uh, spirituality. And they'll talk about how that uh, we are spiritual people and then a string of profanity will come out. And I'm sitting there thinking, boy, that's really spiritual. They have no idea what spirituality really is. Spirituality is your relationship with God. Excuse me, I think I'm talking to some of these men that I teach sometimes. And I talk to them about that tone. By the way, I'm the good guy at Project Rescue. Ronnie, Ronnie Crocker, man, they, they can't stand him. He is a hound dog, and I'm the sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> they like me. I tell Ronnie sometimes, I've done one popularity contest. <laughs> he said, I didn't know there was a popularity contest going on. I said, see there, I'm ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so they like me, they like him. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's changing everything. So when you tell them, you've got to change who you are. They have the same, they have the same, uh, I think, wait a minute. Uh, they have the same reaction that I did. How can I change to be somebody else? Well, that's what the Bible teaches us. Faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, that, what does that do? That makes us a new creature. We have changed, you see. Repentance carries the idea of fruits, and that's where we begin making our amends. Oh, boy, now, all of you don't, don't fall out because you've got to go back in your past, and you've got to, to your ability, straighten up the things that you've done that are wrong. Now, don't tell me it can't be done because I've been back to four or five congregations. Got up to a whole congregation and just honestly said uh, without any uh, soft telling or anything that I practice alcoholism and I, while I was here and I'm sorry will you forgive me and that'll take care of it now the individual ones as you remember you prepare your heart before you do this because if you do it from the head just to say well I got him off my you're going to be sorry that you made some of these. So from the heart, you want to do what is your part to uh, straighten up the harm that you've done. That may mean uh, paying some money that you owe people for things that you you tore up. And you say, well, there are a lot of people who won't forgive me for the things I've done. What does that have to do with it? You can, you can make people forgive you. All you can do is clean up your side of the street and ask, what can I do to make it right? And they say, well, I hope that you'll just die and go to hell. Well, let them alone. You can't do anything with people like that. But let me tell you, even though that you're sitting there saying, boy, they are think that it's the greatest thing you ever have to be in life. And if that's not Christianity, then I've missed it. Romans 12 and 18, as much as life, didn't you live peaceably with all men? Matthew 6, 14 and 15, for if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will they forgive you. Poor fellow won't forgive you, won't ever have a sin forgiven. Don't be mad at him. He's sick. And he's sicker than you are. Galatians 3 and 13. Paul 
tell you this one thing I do. Lay not her behind, I forget. Then go and forget. First Timothy 1 and 13. Who was before a blasphemer injurious. But I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Listen, it's better to remember what you were than what you are. Thank God that I am not what I was going to be. Thank God I'm not what I was. That's the important thing. One person you've got to live with is you. Okay? I bless you. Alcoholic, but he was one of those that got mellow. My dad was an alcoholic, but he was not mellow. I 